They became known as rhythm and blues records. And one of the record companies, Columbia Records, had a subsidiary called OK. And on one side of the record, they would put rhythm side. On the flip side, they would put blues side. The uh, blues was just the standard old uh, gutsy, uh, earthy blues songs. But the flip side usually had a, a nice beat to it, had some more rhythm to it. Country had a, a great influence on rock and roll. Of course, Elvis is given a lot of the credit uh, for the records that he cut on Sun in the early days. But then some kids out in West Texas, Buddy Holly, Jimmy Bowen, Buddy Knox, they were into uh, taking country songs and putting a rock and roll beat to them and uh, coming up with what was called rockabilly. That was in about 56, 57, around that time period. It, it took about five years, I believe. I, I think that the majority of the black records started in about 50 or somewhere, you know, after World War II. They were beginning to creep along in. Uh, then it took, uh, the black radio stations, of course, would play these records. But none of us, like I say, knew what was going on in these black stations. It uh, took a song like Earth Angel, which was a ballad, a ballad done by a black group, to, to get on over into the pop music field. And from there, it uh, just started uh, multiplying. You know, uh, The first rock and roll record I remember hearing as a kid was uh, Chuck Berry's Maybelline in about 1955. I don't think that uh, jazz fits that much into the development of rock and roll. There have been some hits on the rock charts like Brubeck's Take Five and Eddie Harris had Exodus to Jazz in the 60s. A lot of people were trying to fight rock and roll when it started. And uh, in 1959, everybody thought that jazz was going to take over. Because you had PTA groups fighting uh, the kids, saying, hey, that, that's dirty, that's vulgar, that's nasty. Uh, take this uh, rock and roll off the air. And then there was a, a big band breakout in the late 50s. But it took it that long. It actually took the records. The records started on a regional level. And then they would grow to be national hits. It would take quite a while, and records would come from all over the country, different areas of the country. Uh, you'd have a hit breaking out in Washington, and Dallas, and Houston, Austin, you know, and it would become a mushroom into a giant hit. You had hits, sounds from all over the countries until, uh, country until about 1959, when commercialism took over rock and roll. And that's when they started manufacturing stars like Fabian and uh, Paul Anka can carry his own load, but he was too, uh, promotion gimmick from the record companies, you know, find a pretty face and uh, the Fabians, the, the Avalons, as I said, it was a manufactured music as we got into 1958, but it was genuine between 1955 and 1958. Sounds from all over. I, I don't think we can overlook um, Alan Freed. He's the guy who gave the name rock and roll to these. And back in 1952, he was playing these songs that I was calling race music. He was playing things by Roy Milton, Jimmy Liggins, Joe Turner, and uh, I believe that was happening up in Cincinnati, somewhere up north, and he more or less coined the phrase rock and roll, and from there it just kind of spread. Then you've got all the nasty things that happened about rock and roll, considering payola, you know, and uh, let's rip it off the radio because the DJs are getting paid to play certain records. In the 60s, uh, again, we had the commercial influence. It started in 59. We have the big orchestras, the big band uh, sounds with rock and roll vocalists. Then a as you get into a, a group that came from over England way, you, you see that we go back into the pattern of the original days. Okay, in 59, we started going stereo. We started adding strings and horns and trumpets and really producing rock and roll records. In 1964, when the Beatles came in, it was simple. It's just the way that it happened 10 years before, in 1954. Somebody go to a garage, you know, and cut a record, and it became a hit. They were doing it over in England, sending them to us, you know. Half the things that came over from England were not uh, really that good a quality, you know, as far as rock and roll records were going, but it was a different sound to everybody. It was really nothing but a recycling of the sound from 54 that we grew up with. Then from there, the Beatles got into uh, some of the heavier music, the... Uh, Sergeant Pepper was kind of the start of the album phase. Uh, people bought singles up to this time. Then all of a sudden, well, albums used to be, you know, you'd have a hit single, put it on an album, and put junk for the other cuts on the LP. 
who cares what it was, just as long as you've got a hit song that'll sell the album. And it really didn't work that well until, until the groups like the Beatles came along and they made a good concept out of an album. That's part of the story of music today. Music primarily for people. All of these share in common a concern for expressing a feeling, an idea, or telling about an event, and in folk and bluegrass with simple instruments and sound. Progressive country and rock both make use of the new electronic instruments, but there's another form of music that shares the soundscape of today, and we'll be tracking its roots in the next program. <laughs>